on Kabara Holy Head and this is uh, Forgotten Fruits Medieval Mad Bars. Uh, has anybody here had Mad Bars before? See, it's from Forgotten Fruit. I've proven my point. Yay! So first I want to uh, show you this book. Uh, this is uh, a book called Mad Bars Growing and Different by James Stewart. It's out of the English Kitchen series. And uh, this has a lot of history, it's a lot of fun, and it's got some recipes, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass those around. Um, so I'll tell you my long story short, is that uh, in 2013, I bought a bunch of trees on sale, and I planted them. And then we moved, so I dug up all these seedlings, and I replanted them. And then about 10 years later, I'm looking at this tree going, what are these balls on this tree? Because you know, who keeps track of their seedlings when you move around? And so, fortunately, I had eye natural, so I'm like on the computer, and I'm like, two bed lars. What's a bed lar? <laughs> I have no clue what I expected. So, I went into the deep dive and tried to figure it out. And fortunately, Jane had written this book in 2013 on bed lars, so I was able to get a lot of information out of her wonderful book. And it turns out that bed lars were an amazingly popular fruit from like the 19th century to the 17th or 18th century. And then they fell off the point of paper. Um, I also have this uh, uncommon fruits book that has three pages on med bars. So med bars are a fruit. They're, uh, they're really pretty hardy. There's not a lot that eats them. They don't get a lot of the diseases that like uh, apples get, the, the rust and everything. Um, they are called Dogs are or dog butt. Uh, as you can see, they, they're kind of funny looking. So these are what fresh net waters look like. And net waters don't ripen until really late into the fall. These are not ripe. Uh, I'm going to ask if you want, you can take a few of those home. And then when they ripen, you can try them. Because unfortunately, they're just not ripe yet. This is a mistake. So as uh, they ripen, medlars let, B-L-E-T, or rot. And as they let, you see that on the camera, they get kind of brownish and wrinkly. And you can see why in our modern day with our really sweet fruit, our pretty fruit, uh, medlars are not that popular anymore. Uh, if you are daring, you are welcome to open one of these up and try it. They are not sweet. Um, I compare them kind of like an unsweet figgy apple, but you can cook medlars, and they're amazing to cook. And if you cook them and mix them with sugar, they make an amazing medlar cheese. So this is a uh, I can't the apple. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> these are fruit cheeses. Now they're called cheese not because there's any dairy in them, but because they slice like cheese and they act like cheese. Um, the ingredients in this is medlar, sugar, and lemon juice. That's all that's in here. Um, they are in middle in the Middle Ages. In a couple of the cookbooks, they talk about using them on what we would call a charcuterie tray. Did I pronounce that correctly? Uh, so they would serve them with meats and with cheeses and with crackers. And I have meats and cheeses and crackers and napkins. So we can spread, take those around. And uh, so where should we start with medlars? Pliny, Pliny the Elder. We love to start with Pliny the Elder. Everybody heard of Pliny the Elder? I think he died because he went to check out a volcano. Uh, <laughs> But before that, he wrote these natural histories. I believe it was 27 volumes of everything that he knew about. So he thought he knew everything. And uh, <clears throat> the natural histories are considered the first encyclopedia. And he talks about medlars. And he says that you don't want to try to grow medlars from medlar seeds because you just get really nasty medlars. And, uh, and that is true. If you grow fruit, you don't grow fruit trees from the seed because the seed is not going to be the same as the parent. I didn't know this. 
Um, so if you go and buy a Granny Smith apple tree from the store, it was not grown from seed. It is a scion or piece of wood from a Granny Smith apple tree that's been grafted onto rootstock, usually apple. Well, memoirs are kind of weird because they don't, oh, sorry, I get to talk about them. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> medlars, they don't usually graft to medlars, which I found to be the weirdest thing ever. If they're growing medlars, and my medlar tree was grafted onto a pear tree, pear root stock. Um, so, if you're grafting medlars, they recommend grafting them onto pear or onto hawthorn or quince or mayhawk. Now, I did some experiments because that's what we're doing, and we're only at the year one, so I don't have a lot of results. But my girlfriend Maggie has uh, these those nasty pear trees that you don't want to get in your yard, like Bartlett, is that the word? So she has a bunch of Bartlett pears in the world. So we grafted the medlars of the Bartlett pears, and they're doing very well. And I grafted a medlar onto, I grafted medlar scions onto my medlar tree. And none of them took, but I'm not really good at it, so, you know, grafting is hard. But I grafted a medlar scion onto a wild cherry tree, because they're in the same family. And it's actually uh, doing very well. Hopefully by next year, if it's still alive, I'll have a great update. So, let me see. What else would you like to know about medlars? Historically, like I said, they were very, very popular. In the Middle Ages, if you go to um, uh, castle, it with an H, so I forgot the name of Very famous castle. Henry Dean lived there. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, they, they have hawthorn trees, or uh, they have met large trees there today. Um, so we, we made some, um, I made some cheese and I made some jelly. And uh, this jelly didn't, it's not very jelly. It's not jelly at all. <laughs> this jelly's kind of gummy berry. So this is jelly that I let it get to 225 degrees before I poured it out. It became gummy berry. This is jelly that only got to 215 degrees before it boiled over, at which point I started time putting it in the jar. <laughs> this is jelly, oh, that's, this is jelly that made it to 220 degrees. And it's pretty. So if you're going to make jelly, get yourself a candy thermometer. <laughs> and don't, I use a deeper And because uh, I'm always paranoid, my stuff's not going to work, I got some store bought Medlar jelly as well. This is made in England. Where did you buy it? I got it off of Amazon, but it's made in England. Uh, yeah. Amazon, yeah. And uh, so the uh, fruit cheese, as I said, fruit cheese you can make with any fruits. It's not dairy. Um, and you can just plop it on a plate or stick it in a butter dish. But I like to use these molds. These are silicone. I got this from Kenzik because uh, it has some dry on it. And, uh, these are just gold standard molds. You can use them. So the right things to speak them out on the yeah. Um, yeah, they would, uh, in, in medieval times, they would sometimes put them in grass or sawdust, and you let them let over the weeks. And because they're so slow at maturing, uh, people in the Middle Ages would have fresh fruit clear into February. So this would be like the only fruit, really, as far as I know, you could get in England in 1700s during the deep winter. <laughs> so, so they, they are the. So, other than the fruit cheese and the jellies, what other ways were medlars used that you know of? Um, they were used the same as you would use peaches. Uh, if you get Master B's uh, 16th century cookbook, which you did not buy a copy of, 
he it has a medlar pie recipe and it recommends medlars and it's a uh, medlars with uh, some uh, shredded hard cheese and uh, some wine of course because it's a, you know an Italian recipe and you boil the medlars down to get the medlars out of the uh, you boil them down and then you, you smash them. And then what I do is I take the that that concoction after it's been cooking for a while, and I put that in my colander, and I have a big uh, stainless steel potato masher, and I push everything through, and it leaves the skin up on the top of the seeds. If you open them up, you'll notice that there are five little seeds in there. And, uh, <clears throat> so they have these seeds that are really rough. And uh, they're hard to get to, to work around, so you want to use the colander to keep the seeds and the skins from being. Do you have a knife for the juggler? Does I have an extra knife for the jelly? I did not bring an extra knife. Where's the spoon? I can crunch down to the chip. Where's the. I'm not very bright. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> Um, and so, oh, I didn't bring it. So here are, sometimes the nut bars don't let or ripen well. Sometimes they just go straight to this kind of hard, gross, bumpy looking thing. And uh, I don't know why, but I brought a few examples of the gross, bumpy looking things. So if your nut bars don't look like that, you don't want to eat them. But you can't eat them really hard. What else would we like to know about that? So we know uh, they were at least around since Plenty. And Plenty said that they weren't around in Kato's time. So that kind of gives us a little bit of a time feeling for when they showed up. Oh, please. I think sure the, the Ruder name was Dog's Arse. Were there any other names that they're known by? Uh, Dog's Arse is the big one. Um, if you go into Shakespeare, has mentioned them several times because they have to actually become rotten to be edible. And he uh, uses that to refer to some uh, women's sexuality and that if they're um, too 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 fresh, they're not necessarily good. <laughs> it's just kind of a fun story. Um, Uh, I planted my tree in 2013, and I got the first couple balls in 2022. And in 2023, I got a really big harvest, and in 2024, I've gotten a nice harvest. So 10 years, which is not uncommon for a fruit tree. And I live in Kentucky, which um, the soil is clay. Um, if you had planted it in a much nicer soil and actually fertilized it and took care of it and not brought it, is that okay? Yeah, I plant it. <laughs> probably be getting fruit in six years. But that's just. With Pliny and Shakespeare, they're obviously in England. Are they in other parts of Europe or the world as well, natively? Uh, natively, they came out of Turkey, and uh, Turkey was where, where it says they come out of Turkey. I have not been able to track primary documentation to find it, uh, but it's what everyone says on the internet. So we know it's true, right? <laughs> and, uh, so I don't know exactly when they came over to England, but we know that in the 11th century and the 17th century, they were being ordered and brought in to be planted in, in the royal orchards. Are they related to any other fruits? Uh, they were, they're in the uh, rosacea family, so they're related to rose, apples, pears, plums. Um, <clears throat> Cherries. That's why I took a chance on grafting one to a wild cherry because I don't like the wild cherries anyway. Um, they're not good for the horses. We cut them down. And so far, it's broken. Now, if you're going to get a seedling from uh, from a uh, nursery, the scion 
branch, the piece of wood that's grafted, will take on the nature of your rootstock. So if you graft medlar to medlar, medlars grow very crooked, and they have uh, crooked branches. They almost get bushy. But if you graft it to a pear tree, for example, you'll get a nice tall tree. My tree that they formed was grafted to a pear tree, so it's pretty tall, and it's, it's in pretty good shape. If you um, graft it to a hawthorn, you're going to get different. It's going to take on the nature of the hawthorn and be bushier. And they come. you have to be careful because sometimes the, uh, the rootstock, even years and years later, will start growing out and push out your regular tree. But that happens with like apples and everything. That's not specific. Now, one of the reasons I think medlars are generally grafted to other trees instead of grafted on the medlar seedlings is because I have yet to find anybody who's been able to make a medlar seed germinate. And I've been on the internet for over a year. And I've been talking to people. Nobody would. And people will say, well, it's because it takes two, two winters to stratify. Okay, but did you grow it? Well, no, but I know it takes two. Well, how do you know it? <laughs> and uh, I put up a scientific article where they're talking about scarification of the seeds. because The seeds are really thick, so it's hard to germinate. So they were actually sandblasting the seeds but they never followed up with any germination. They just gave the details on how much the seeds the seeds were uh, shrunk by the sandblasting. So again, I'm like, where's the science here? <laughs> so if you know anybody who's actually grown a med bar the seeds, let me know, because I'm very excited to learn that. You know, it's kind of gummy that, that it's just, yeah, it's going to be there. Now, I think it is interesting that the uh, the medlar uh, cheese and the jellies are made with the exact same ingredients, just medlar sugar and lemon juice. There's no gelatin in there? No. Um, I throw a few of the not ripe medlars in because they're higher in pectin. Uh, you could add pectin, and if I had added pectin and not gotten it to 220 degrees, it may have set if I had added pectin in. So I was able to do this when I when I started this. I had no idea how do you how do you prepare a medlar. So you know, I went online, watched some videos, and the guy made the ones that does. So I I, I I boiled everything up, and then I went and I squished it all through the colander, and then you take and wrap that, and you pour that in cheesecloth, and you squeeze out all the juice. And it's the pulp, the squeeze and dry pulp that you use to make the cheese. So I'm looking at the juice and I'm like, what do I do with the juice? Because like when, when I'm doing SCA stuff, I, I try to think of what would Kubara Holyhead have done with this? Well, she's not going to waste all this net bar juice, right? And it's packed full of vitamin C, it's great stuff. So then, well, I'll try to make jelly out of it. I actually don't know if jelly is a pure recipe. I haven't worked with that yet. So I don't know. I don't know if there are any savory medlar recipes, but that it's not a particularly sweet fruit, and I know fruit and savory make it taste very common and delicious. The, uh, the pie I made, which I, mean, I didn't have enough medlars to make the pie for this class, unfortunately, um, is a savory um, dish. And interestingly to me, uh, in the Italian cookbook that, that uh, Master B redacted, they use a lot of pepper, and I mean a lot of pepper. When I was going through and, and cooking the recipes, I'm like, oh, that's a lot of pepper. Um, but I trusted the process, and I added the pepper, and it, it, it gives it a, a, a spice, but it's not hot. It doesn't taste like pepper when you've got it in the pie itself. And so, yeah, they would use that, and in, in that, that's a savory dish, as I said, made with cheeses, et cetera. Um, the sweetest thing on the Italian 16th century recipe is when the uh, they make the crust, they recommend uh, using, for, for the high table, you would use rose water or uh, orange water. And I use rose water, and now I'm like addicted to rose water pastries. Uh, <laughs> don't use rose oil, they're two different things. <laughs> I didn't know that, but uh, you know, I follow the uh, instructions. I don't know, um, since we have, we're videoing this. Would anybody like to try to describe what they think of as the taste? And we only have one type of medlar. There are multiple types. Oh yeah. Come in. 
Um, not as many as apples. So with apples, you have yeah, your granny snip, and you've got uh, other apple types. Red oh, delicious. Yeah. Yellow red. Yeah. Yeah. Delicious. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yes. But much less all the herb apples that have sort of faded away. Ten of half of the dry state in front of the That's a good description. <laughs> it's the the jelly is is very mild. Um, I, I can see why it's it's almost a peach flavor kind of kind of what, what else to describe it as. Kind of where I go with this piggy apple. Um, okay, it, it is a, not a sweet fruit. Like I said, until you cook it down with the sugar, it's not sweet. It's kind of bland, I think. It's like it's got a hint of apple. A lot of people describe it as having apple cinnamon flavor. I don't really catch the cinnamon. Mm -hmm. More of a pear? Yeah, that that is true. And uh, I think we got her name. There's a Laurel out in Antier who had a class on this at her uh, at their big cooking symposium, and she had nine different varieties of that bars to try. And I wanted to go so badly, and uh, somebody said that that was not a uh, responsible use of our money for me to fly across the country to try nine types of pet bars. They were wrong. I would move for some How many varieties of pet bars are there? Is there one of those? Um, um, this, like, this book here, I just place, I think I have it 12 days. If you're in Kentucky and you go south of Lexington, down the Sand Gap, uh, where my brother Aiden or Adam lives, uh, Drogo lives down there, there's a man named Clifford England who has huge orchards and he has several different varieties of pet bars. That's where I got my sign off from. Um, but I uh, haven't gone down there yet to see if he's got anything to harvest. Sorry. No, please uh, ask. Because I'm not. Just to mention, like, there would have been like the only fresh fruit available in like the dead winter. Do we know if they were like any holiday recipes that have survived that they would have been very popular as like Christmas or New Year's ones? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to look it up. They say a lot of them. They they said to uh, they would serve them raw or make make them the cheese and then serve them on their the plate platters with the, the cut meats and the cheeses and the breads and stuff. Uh, that's why I thought I thought they had it so I'm excited. Yeah. Because like, you know, do you really want to just take a spoonful of jelly in your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> I mean I would do it. <laughs> <laughs> that was nice. Yeah. Sorry, I came in just a little late. Did you say what variety these were? I guess with a P. Purus or it's Italian. Um, Yes, thank you. I'm dyslexic, so anything with too many letters, I can't say yeah. very well. I yeah, got served an article about this thing a week ago, and I looked at one of the pictures and it was going to buy a picture. So we did a piece done ahead of time. Excellent. And they are self fertile. I only have one tree, and I'm pretty sure mine is the only tree in northern Kentucky. <laughs> and it is covered in, in uh, little balls. Well, it was two weeks ago before I started shaking it. <laughs> I was like, I need some little balls, guys. <laughs> I'm assuming this isn't something that needs to go by. I have never heard of them anywhere outside of the SCA and Clifford England and a couple of nurseries where I've checked them out.
You, you are correct. I am in 6B, and they seem to be doing very well in 6B in Kentucky. Um, I, I, I don't know, because they're, they're pretty sturdy, and they're self-fertile, and their flowers don't come out till late. So like with the peaches and the pawpaws, I love my pawpaws. Um, if you have a late frost with peaches and pawpaws, you lose your harvest because the late frost kills them. But these um, don't come out until really late, like April, May, so late frosts don't affect it. First day, I was going to purchase one. Uh, it says that if I don't buy it, then I'm Yeah, so they, they can tolerate some heat and they can tolerate cold. Southern California, though, so that's what my family's from. My dad loves growing things, but he probably did not. He's not a good thing for much. I don't know. Um, Five is pretty warm. You, you could try it. Would it depend with which rootstock you put it on? The nature of the tree will depend on the rootstock. Um, with regards to growing them in different um, zones, I don't know enough about growing to know that. Is anybody else growing trees in different zones? Like, I am obsessed with pawpaws, which is a Native American tree. And you can grow pawpaws in Texas. But you don't get any pop off fruit in Texas. You have to have so many cold days before they'll grow. Pop offs like to have a pop offs to fertilize them. They don't like to self fertilize the way the, the flowers come out. They're like, they're all one gender or sex. They're all one sex, not gender, sorry. They're all one sex to begin with, and then they transition to the other ones so they don't have enough male and female at the same time to be good self fertilizing. What else can I tell you about? What's your favorite combination of the Oh, man. Um, I have a, I've gotten into this weird thing with my neighbors. I have chickens and they lay eggs. So I give eggs to my neighbors and then suddenly my neighbors started bringing me baked goods. And this really works well for me. And one of my neighbors is amazing. And she makes a zucchini bread and a banana nut bread. And I love to toast that and top it off with some medlar jelly. So that's one of my favorite. And the, the medlar just complements the banana nut bread so well. But she's an amazing baker. Yes, blended ripened medlars, um, which are not ready yet this year. Uh, but uh, fortunately, past coat took medlars from last year and threw them in the freezer. So what you're eating are from medlars that I stored over the year in the freezer and then bought out last week to make this. Did you store them after they blended? Or before? Yes, after they blended. So you have this whole thing, you know, this whole box of medlars. And every couple of days you go through and you look at them and go, is that, no, that one's still pretty orange. Uh, how's that one? No, it's still orange. And then you find them as they start to turn brown, they'll get darker. And then when they get uh, dark brown and wrinkly, that's when you start pulling them out. And because I knew I wasn't going to use all of them last year, I threw some of them in the bag and threw them in the freezer so I could have them. Now, I would say that freezing them and cooking them probably uh, makes the seeds not want to germinate. This is, I haven't germinated a seed yet. <laughs> and I'm trying. I've got them outside in different conditions. I've got them in the fridge in different conditions. I mean, um, they've got to be cold stratified. It's close to freezing. <laughs> and uh, the horses won't eat them. Which is uh, my horse eats everything. And I have a persimmon tree, and as soon as those persimmons hit the ground and bounce, he's like, ooh, and he's going over there and eating my persimmons. So I have to collect the persimmons every night, go out and shake the tree and get the, the fallen persimmons if I want to save them from freedom. But he will not eat them. He doesn't go around and pick these up. So, much less good or bad. <laughs> Probably also a majority of that year. Yeah, the 
deer have never followed this tree. Well, if they come off the tree like this, I can see that. Yeah, they they don't taste it when they first come off the tree. You right. gotta just let them sit. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, they would uh, in, the, in the middle ages, from what I understand, they just have uh, little shallow boxes and they fill them with like sawdust or or uh, uh, hay or straw, straw, and then they don't get smashed. Hang it. And I had them let and sit out of my house until February, and they were fine to eat last year. They were just as good in February as they were in November and December. But they would have traveled so well. Do you know if they were popular in one of the trade routes? I do not have an answer to that. So yeah, I just kind of started down this bedlock like path after last year when I was like, this is kind of cool. And so I've never heard of this before, so I just got to read it about it. So now I have a whole bunch of, uh, I have some hawthorn and may haw planted and some quince planted. <laughs> so I'm going to be trying to graft them as they grow up. And we're, we're experimenting, like I said, with the bark of pears and with the wild cherries. Uh, my clipper told me, clipper did, but he said that, um, that I need to make sure you cut as close to the dirt as you can on your scion, on your rootstock, excuse me. And graft your scion and then cover that that uh, where, that where they join the dirt so that your rootstock doesn't grow up through it. I haven't had an experience yet, so I don't know if that's accurate. But that means that there's got acres and acres of, of fruit trees. Like, you know, so I, think. And I this, this spring I ordered a, several more medlar seedlings from several different companies. So hopefully, uh, 10 years from now, we get to try different flavors of Ben Mars. <laughs> and they do have very different flavors, just as apples have different flavors. At least that's what uh, Mr. Teller told me when she was in the class over on the interior, and she was texting me pictures and telling me, oh, this one tastes like this. <laughs> do you remember? Do I remember what she said? Yeah. Text each other that often. <laughs> it's my mysterious device. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she sent pictures and everything. So the pie was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she has pictures. It's kind of hard to see. But, uh, so she had these marked from the uh, UK and France. These are pictures from Mr. Teloise, where she uh, was showing that they, they all look a little bit different, just like your very delicious apples look different from your The large one is whiny and has decent acidity and sweetness, a little stringy. The small French, very smooth, very liquid sweet with apricot like notes. Balance my favorite so far. So she has some from uh, Iranian, I think that's Georgian and Middle Eastern. And uh, so you can see that they're all different sizes and they look different. I'm very excited. Ten years from now, hopefully, if my giant burrito lives, um, we'll be able to give it to the next few years. I hope for it to be successful in ten years. Yeah, that's right. Ten years. I'm interested that they're, they're so small. Nobody's tried to, like the apples and, and pears, try to propagate them to be bigger. Yeah, um, uh, these are bigger than those are fairly big. Yeah, she, she goes on to describe them. Let me see. Iranian, notably acid, less sweet than the French varieties. Interesting aftertaste, more gritty. The middle ones are sweet, faintly apple taste, a lot like the one you had, like an applesauce. And the third one is remarkably citrusy, with almost floral notes. Uh, they are all similar, but astonishingly different. So, uh, 
and the Hudson Channel at the brothers and so on. So I'm, I'm very excited to, to get these different types of tribes. I agree. I think it's weird that uh, they've not been bred bigger, but I think they've just lost interest. And they would be great for uh, transport. Um, as I said, I, I have a, a, an obsession with pawpaws. I think I can say that. And pawpaws are never going to be popular in the common grocery store because you, you pick them and they, they're, they're bad in five days. Um, nobody wants to deal with that. So you can pick these and they're, they're, they're good for months. <laughs> but I've literally never found one at the store before. They're, the giant Brita is supposed to be that big. Um, so I have two giant Britas in my yard right now. But I, I can't imagine going into the grocery store, not in an American grocery store, and having somebody try to sell you that. Persimmon pulp is way juicier. Yeah. Um, and persimmons, oh my goodness, have you ever bitten into a not quite all the way there yet persimmon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes your mouth just feel fuzzy and weird. <laughs> and I, I do have a website. I put information on medlars and the other up on my website. It's, it's a work in progress, but I really want to encourage people in the SCA. We do so much research, and we, we find out so many things, and then, like, we don't record anything. So, look at my website. It's uh, Kumara SCA Weekly, I believe. Uh, it's the you have a website, and not tell me what it is. It's Kumara, uh, C-U-M-H-A-R-A, sca.weebly.com. Weebly has two E's, right? Weebly has two E's, yes. Wow. So I, I want to encourage anybody in the SCA who wants to do research, make a web page and start um, collecting the information that you're getting so you can share it with others and then find other people who want to geek out on the pillars. That one. Yeah, that one. There was a couple pages on that bars. Talking about my silly journey, and you can see me trying to learn to figure out how to cook when I really don't know what I'm doing, and um, there were some failures, but hey, it was all fun. And uh, it, it's been a blast. So now I have two trees I can geek out on. And I can talk to you about pawpaws all day. But trying to get documentation on pawpaws is so hard because it's Native American breed. And Native Americans didn't have the types of documentation that you get from Henry VIII's gardener. <laughs> I guess if that's it, that's it. You can stop. Yeah. Yeah. Very delicious. Yeah.